Welcome to Creative Distillation, where we distill entrepreneurship research into actionable insights. I am your host, Jeff York, Professor of Entrepreneurship and Research Director at the Deming Center for Entrepreneurship at the Leeds School of Business at the University of Colorado Boulder. And with me today, as always, I have my co-host. Hello, Jeff. I'm Brad Warner. I'm the Faculty Director for Entrepreneurship at the Leeds School of Business, Deming Center for Entrepreneurship, I should say. Uh, the titles are getting way too long here, but uh, <laughs> uh, but it's oh. good to see you. And I, I, I'm very excited about today because we have three samples of booze. Yes. But anyway, it's, it's good to see you, Jeff. How are you doing? Um, I'm all right, Brad. You know, I'm hanging in there. Uh getting towards the end of the semester uh i'm uh i'm i'm, I'm sorely disappointed that uh some teams i had competing in the new venture challenge which is our wonderful cross-campus entrepreneurship challenge at cu boulder did not make it to the finals and i'm very very sad and disappointed and surprised because i've got some amazing teams in my class so i've got people doing everything from roboticizing chemical experiments 3D printing a substitute for human cells for preclinical trials of uh, drugs, uh, electrified space engine. We got amazing stuff going on, uh, training leadership through the use of horses and revolutionizing the way people learn math, which is a totally appropriate to this online thing. I know you've got a ton of amazing ventures too, right, Brad? Oh, yeah. I mean, a, a ton, more than I can list. But you know what? I think that this is a really good time to talk about investor fit if we have entrepreneurs listening to the podcast. And not every entrepreneur, when they pitch, is going to be pitching in front of the right investors and they don't know it. And I just want to, I just really want to stress that if you have a pitch in front of investors and it doesn't resonate to keep on moving because odds are, if you've done all your work and you've done your validation and you have a sustainable competitive advantage, they just don't understand it. It's not a fit in their portfolio, in their life, in their vision, whatever it is. I just don't want you to give up. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and the other thing that I think people have to realize is in these uh, pitch competitions, it, it, it's an artificial construct uh, in many ways, but no matter what you do, the judges that are going to be there, whomever's judging it, is going to bring their own lens. And they're always going to think about it from an investor lens, no matter what you yeah. do, and no matter what you tell them, no matter how many times you jump up and down and say, look, I just want you to assess the quality of this work that these students have done and, and uh, the progress they've made to date and the quality of the presentation and not think about whether you would invest with it or not. Do they ever listen to that, Brad? Never, never. I mean, if you have someone that's invested in hospitality their yep. entire life and then get they get presented some sort of healthcare solution, they probably won't. Yeah, they don't get it, right? Won't be able to understand it, understand the market, the whole thing. So really, that's right. and, for, for those entrepreneurs, and I, because I know it's heartbreaking for entrepreneurs going through oh, this, this process, uh, I just really advise you to stick with it. Odds are, especially if you're coming out of working with Jeff and myself, uh, that it's the investor's issue and not yours. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 you know, we always try to expand our students networks greatly. So and, yep. and this is interesting, like, just to get back to the, the, the theme of the podcast, you know, at the Deming Center uh, for Entrepreneurship, we're always trying to integrate research insights, classroom teaching and real world education, which is why I, I love having this partnership with Brad, someone who's been a, a serial entrepreneur and investor his whole life. Someone like me, who's uh, kind of this ivory tower uh, nerd. <laughs> so I um, <laughs> well said. Yeah, thank you. I thought I thought you'd like that comparison, right? And then you got someone who's really good looking, popular with, with all people, charismatic. And then there's Brad. And so, you know, that's that's really a good a good balance as well. Uh, you know what, Jeff? You have a face for radio. That's all I'll say. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. I'll be here all week, folks. Yeah. Uh, but no, I was gonna say the research backs this up. Like, you know, so this theory of entrepreneurship has really gained a lot of traction in recent years called effectuation, uh, created by Sarah Sarasvati at uh, the Darden School at UVA, talks about this process of how expert entrepreneurs do not go out and say, okay, if I can just get, oh, I'm picking a name, I can get Elon Musk to take my call, then he'll see the value of this thing or, or whatever investor or stakeholder they think is really important. They go out, oh, I gotta get that person involved. And that never works, first of all. Yep. And really good entrepreneurs don't do that anyway. What they do is they just talk to anyone and everyone they can get an audience with, figuring it's an opportunity to get my pitch. And it's kind of like maximizing the possible pool of likely hits, uh, just like a VC's portfolio, maximizing the number of opportunities to find the right person that puts skin in the game and connects with them. And that's, that's what these entrepreneurs have to do. 
Totally agree. Totally agree. And the other thing is, um, I'm approached by people to invest in their businesses pretty much on a daily basis. And the one thing that, that really sticks out to me is when they come up to me and they say, Brad, I only need 10 grand. Right there, I'm like, uh-uh. <laughs> They have no understanding of the business. They have no understanding of where they need to get to break even. And so to me, it's really a lack of credibility when, when you lead off with that statement. Fair enough. So so everybody out there, ask Brad for at least half a million um, <laughs> when you go talk to I'll him. I'll still say no, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyway, it, it is hard because we become so close to these students and we watch them work so hard. And, and they're not just students, they're actual entrepreneurs trying to launch yes. real businesses. So, you know, it becomes very difficult to see it when they don't succeed in some of these things, but they do persist and keep going. Okay. So, so that's what's going on in my life this week, uh, anyway, or towards the end of this week, but on the podcast, we got cool things to talk about today. Yes, we do. So uh, we are really thrilled to have Nels Rowe with us today. Uh, Nels is the founder of Dryland Distillers, uh, which you can find at drylanddistillers.com. They're also located on Main Street in lovely Longmont, Colorado, which uh, a faculty friend of mine just bought a house in. Uh, so I'll be sending him over there. And uh, Nels is joining us to talk a little bit about the history and the offerings of Dryland. Welcome, Nels. Well, hello, gentlemen. Hello. Thanks. Thanks for having me today. It's our pleasure. Yeah, Nels, it's great having you. So we'd love to hear kind of how you got into being a distiller and, and what, what brought you kind of this point today. Sure. Well, I, you know, I was just listening to kind of the background lead in into this episode. And just to tie this back, first off, I 100% agree with everything you said about the entrepreneurship, because that's really what it's about for me. In fact, when I was a, an undergrad, I had a entrepreneurship professor at the University of Wyoming, where I graduated, basically tell me uh, that, hey, I should probably seriously consider taking the idea I had from my uh, senior level entrepreneur course and see if I could uh, actually pull that off. And it was actually a pre-coffee shop. Everything has blown up with coffee shops over the last 20 years, but it was pre-coffee shop. So sure enough, what did I do? I took the idea that I pitched in class and my first gig out of college was opening my own coffee shop. <laughs> nice. right. so I had zero money. I had an, an idea. I had a pitch. I had a business plan. So yes, indeed, I had to talk to about 40 people before I actually was able to pull it off and, and find somebody who was actually willing to take a chance on more me than the idea. So don't right. give up. And right. that, that introduction ties directly into Dryland Distillers for me because while I did spend time in a more of a corporate career, I had a 20 year career working for a, a, a consulting firm, a leadership development uh, firm. During that period of time though, I had nine different senior level roles and in many of them being very, very diverse. So looking for those different experiences, maybe, maybe it was to keep me interested as my wife would say. But what I found is that led me to Dryland Distillers because I realized that I really genuinely missed the opportunity to control my own story and do something that hadn't been done before. Right. Even though it seems like in the, in the world of distilling, ever whiskey's old, and, you know, it's been around for a long time. Making spirits is, is just, it, it's been around with. But honestly, what's different about Dryland is we felt there was an opportunity to create something that was uniquely Colorado and uniquely local. And we did not feel that had been done properly. And so I had the chance with a friend of mine who was a photographer in town in Longmont also uh, to work for, for, for drinks only. There was a startup publication uh, out of Montana called Microshiner. They needed somebody to do some interviews and profiles freelance of these crazy startup distillers in Colorado now six or seven years ago. And I said, come on, Luke, this is an opportunity for at least for some free booze somewhere. <laughs> So we spent a year touring different startups, some of the, the, the originals in Colorado, met some wonderful people, tasted some really, really fun spirits. And I realized I love this industry. I love the people I met. I love Colorado. I've been, have grown up in the West and I was itching to do something different. And so Dryland was created from our goal of taking something that is very traditional, uh, making spirits, making whiskey, and then figuring out how do we create something that is unique to Colorado and unique to the American West in a way that kind of fosters what we all believe in, which is the local community, uh, lo local environment, and, and um, just honoring the place we love. And that led to Dryland because we, we realized that we are living in a very, very difficult state to grow virtually anything in. Um, yep. and 
if as a gardener, think, I can attest to that. Yeah, there you go. Right. And so when we looked at the grains, you know, that are typically used in spirits like our whiskey, we, we felt that the only one that really felt local enough was wheat because we, there's some history with wheat uh, throughout the Western U.S. And so we, we decided to seek out uh, the grains that would be most appropriate for Colorado. We did uh, stumble across what, which is now considered the oldest wheat in North America that had never been distilled before that grows in the Sonoran Desert. And that was the, that was the seed of dryland right there it was actually you know, taking the time to find something that was locally appropriate um, and then deciding, can we build not only a spirit out of this, but can we build a business off of that as well? So how old is your business? So we're four years into it, um, four years of distilling, three years of actually being open. Great, great. And is, is your whiskey and your actually your entire selection, is it available only at your distillery or can we find it anywhere else in Colorado? You can find it at uh, select retailers throughout the Front Range few mountain communities as well. Starting this, probably this fall in September, it will be available in multiple states uh, through, through online direct consumer delivery as well. Congrats. That's great. Well, speaking of whiskey, why don't we try some? I'm anxious for you to try some. Okay. Before, before we started recording today, I was just telling the guys that I really have been smelling this all day. I even had my wife who doesn't drink. I had her smell it and she was thinking maybe she'd try a bourbon. Hey, all right. The convert. Yeah. Which one are we? Which one are we trying? I went with the whiskey right away. You know oh, me. Of course you did. <laughs> yeah. Of course. All right. Yes, hey, I've had to put up with sour beers for a couple of recordings. This this is a great <laughs> Just start. One. We had one recording with sour beer. Oh, that was bad though. Oh, and I went to a new brewery, Brad. I had a I had a great double uh, double milkshake IPA, <laughs> strawberry lactose. Oh, oh God. And they make some sour smoothie style ales. Oh uh, man. We're lining up. Holy cow! But back to this. Um, this smells wonderful. Really great, right? Holy cow. So what are we smelling? What you you have there is our heirloom wheat whiskey. Mm-hmm. It, it is 100% single grain wheat whiskey made with the oldest uh, wheat in North America. We're the only distiller in the country that we know of distilling this grain. And you're tasting a whiskey that is, is un- unique because of that. We, we distill specifically to bring out as many characteristics of the grain itself in that whiskey. Is this a whiskey that I would have found in a cowboy bar, bar in the 1800s? It's possible. Wheat whiskeys, American wheat whiskeys, are historically one of the, the, the first wheat whiskeys. Fell out of favor. Um, there's only a handful of distillers today distilling that kind of an original American whisk, style whiskey. Corn, which is typically uh, found in bourbons, barley, those crops became a lot cheaper and a lot, they have a lot more yield typically than wheat does when you try to get the alcohol out of it. Wow, it tastes great. Tastes great. What do you think, Jeff? Uh, it's, it's great. I mean, it, it is different, though. It, it's got a softness to it, is how I would describe it. Almost bread-like, in a way. Um, I don't know if that's just psychological, because it's the wheat, but super smooth. Yeah. That is exactly what we're going for. We wanted the grain to come through. The ancient grain has a lot of silky notes, a lot of sweet notes. It's very gentle. Even if you taste our whiskey straight off the still, unaged whiskey, the classic moonshine people's eyes up and they're like i can i can actually drink this right (laughs) you know so i give all credit to the grain it's a gorgeous grain it's uh, something that we are thrilled to have been able to turn into a spirit the finish is fabulous as well How, how many iterations of recipes did it take you to land on this so it took us seven full batch cycles which doesn't sound like a lot but that's a lot of grain a lot of experimentation to go through yeah some of the biggest challenges we had, because it's such an old grain, the enzyme structure and the protein structure in the grain is quite different than modern grains. Uh, we could not get modern yeasts that you would typically use in distilling or brewing to, to play well with it. Mm-hmm. Really? Yeah. So we ended up having to work with uh, specialists at, at White Labs. They're, yeah, they're- right around the corner in Boulder. We got to get those guys on something. Yeah. Talk about yeast. And, and particularly sour beer yeast. <laughs> Then I sour you on, on yeast. I don't want <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm sorry, Nels. I just, I got, I got the sour beer is a running, <laughs> running so issue. We ended up uh, working with one of their specialists who, I love the quote. She was basically said, I think you guys are chasing a pink unicorn if you're going to want to get anything out of this, this grain. I'm like, okay, a pink unicorn. Like <laughs> Not just a unicorn. <laughs> yeah. But what she told us, what we finally decided to do, we decided to inoculate one of their commercial strains with raw grain from the field and do open fermentation. Mm-hmm. 
we basically created our own strain of yeast that we do harvest. And what that allowed it to do is allowed it to build on the commercial strain, which had a lot of the characteristics we liked, as well as the stability we liked. We, we brought in the natural yeasts from the environment that the grain grows in, and we were able to get our yields up. So it was a bit of a journey there. Um, the enzyme structure is unique enough. We, we did a lab analysis of it. We got the lab analysis back. The comments to the side were, you got a ton of enzymes in here, and we have no idea what they're doing. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, thanks for the heads up. All right. So we use only wheat and water when we mash this. So there was nothing else that we add. We activate every enzyme in that grain using temperature control. So it's, um, it's a pretty pure whiskey and you're getting the true essence of the grain. And then how long do you age it? That's the other lovely part about this. The whiskey you're tasting has been aged just over a year. Really? That's it? Yep. What kind of barrels are you aging in? We use new American oak barrels, light char, char two, uh, basically. And uh, we do use a very good cooperage, Kelvin Cooperage. They're out of Louisville. Uh, and they use no petrochemicals when they char their barrels. Right. We found that the whiskey itself and the grain is easy to overwhelm with a barrel. And we don't overage it. And so there's an advantage. Not only do we get a really silky, smooth whiskey out of a solid barrel, it's, it, it happens fairly quickly. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I mean, I'm also getting like uh, almost like a, a honeyish kind of finish. It's uh, there is a sweetness to it, right? That a lot of bourbons don't have, or a lot of whiskeys don't have. Uh, yeah, really nice, man. Very. I good. have to tell you, and I, I've never said this on the podcast before, but this one is going to go on my shelf for uh, every day. It's it's that good to me. I I think it's it's fantastic, Nels. Thank you. You have never said that. <laughs> I haven't. No, no, uh, but. Yeah. Uh, how much is a bottle? So the bottle is 71 for a full size. Uh, we also do half size bottles and uh, it's a brutally expensive grain. That's all I can say. We, yeah, I bet. We successfully grew our first commercial crop in Colorado, our grower just east of the distillery. Oh, wow. Uh, this last summer. So we are ex- hoping to get that grain price down a bit. Uh, we even had to source the seed grain for him. He planted a dry land crop. In the driest year, in 99 years, he's had in Colorado as a fourth generation farmer. And what was interesting is even though he panicked, thinking we were going to get virtually nothing, this grain did better than virtually any of the other modern grains with no water. Really? That's interesting. Yep. Joel, did you have a chance to taste this when you were over at the distillery? You're right. You're muted. By the way, uh, Four Noses now has a beer called Your Muted Chuck. I think it's called. It's just saw it the other day. It's really good. Good hazy IPA. Just to, just to drop that. I, I, it's the okay. first. It's the first pandemic theme beer name I've seen. I thought it was pretty impressive. Uh, but now I'll let Joel talk. Sorry, Joel. Uh, I did try the whiskey when I went out to uh, Dryland to pick this up for you guys, and it really is delicious. And the still they have out there is very impressive. It's quite an operation in a very small space. Very small. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it is, uh, delicious. Uh, it's just wonderful. Should we, should we try the gin next? Yeah. So the, you basically building on the theme of dryland, which is let's, let's honor Colorado and the American West in the way, the best way possible. We decided to throw one more challenge down our gin, which is what I would re- recommend we try next. As far as we know, it's the first true hundred percent native Colorado gin. Uh, every, everything in it is native to the state. That limitation was an extreme limitation because there was not that much you can work with in Colorado that is a standard for gin. And uh, this one took us 27 batches. Oh my God. And we finally got it right when we decided, when we let Colorado be Colorado, we were trying to create a gin that was more of a traditional gin you'd expect. And when you're missing things like citrus, for example, Colorado has no native citrus. You got a big hole in your botanical profile. So we just let the botanicals finally tell us where they were going to go. So we use native, uh, native juniper, which is a, one of the three native junipers to the state. It's a single seed juniper, the only one in the state. It's super gentle. And so we've, we've basically created a gin, which is super sippable, very gentle. Even though it's loaded with juniper, 99% of the botanical basket we use is juniper. It's not overly juniper heavy. And what we always get, we get, get the reaction a lot. People say, oh, I'm not a gin drinker. I'm not a gin fan. And they just try it. And they're like, wow, I think I could actually like this gin because it is quite different. I, I was just thinking the same thing. You know, I, I'm just kind of curious, though, about the overall strategy. When you go into the distilling business, which was the first thing that you made? Was it the whiskey? So the first thing we made, there are two of them we made in parallel. The heirloom wheat whiskey mm-hmm. that we, we wanted to really get that recipe dialed in. 
And then the one you're going to try next is the, the cactus spirit because mm -hmm. we had wanted to make an original true domestic mezcal, but we did not want to use any adjuncts or any pre-processed ingredients in our spirits. So that meant we had to source raw agave and raw agave was virtually impossible to source then. And it still is now. It's even harder to get now. We worked with a now retired professor at CSU. He ran the Grand Junction Research Station in, until about three years ago. And uh, he helped us kind of understand what single varietal of agave might grow in Colorado and stuff in Colorado, but we couldn't find any. It was either a situation yeah. where we'd have to plant it and, and har harvest it seven years later, or we'd have to go forage and tear up land. And that was not part of our plan. Right. Um, so a friend of mine from Sonora, who had taught us the process of making mezcal. When I was hiking with my dog outside of, you probably know a button or um, I'm sorry, a rabbit mountain just out of Boulder. Oh yeah. 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 So, well, when you take a, a young pup out there and they trips around a little too far, they get cactus thorns in their pads. Yes, and they they do. Know, sitting there pulling cactus thorns out of, out of her pads. And I'm like, there's a lot of prickly pear around here. And I wonder if you could use this in three plays of God. So that was one of the, the other key recipes we developed is we said, let's just see if we can take the prickly pear cactus, which is pseudo related to uh, yucca as a, as a succulent and uh, see if we could get something out of it. And sure enough, so we, we developed the process of the recipe for the heirloom wheat and the, the cactus spirit more or less at the same time to really, really try to bring a, a true Colorado spirit into the glass. And so that took us some trial and error. Although surprisingly, the cactus took us it was faster to get to the recipe itself, harder to figure out how do we process the cactus. <laughs> it was yeah, a, that's, I mean, that's gotta be like a, an awful process. I mean, what, what do you do? I mean, how, what, how does it work? Like uh, this gotta be incredibly labor intensive. Painful, painful. <laughs> Literally. Yeah. I, my hands are, are scarred. My psyche is scarred as well. <laughs> wow. Because you truly we, are suffering for your craft. <laughs> yeah. We did first just, find friends who had uh, property just outside of Lyons. And they said, yeah, we got lots of prickly pear. Come on yeah, up and try. Come on out. <laughs> so we did that at first and um, we had to learn how to use double welding gloves to harvest it. We ended up bringing up a blender. We burned up a food processor, trying to figure out how do you, how do you process this stuff? You know, we, we, so we finally ended up on a wood chipper. Uh, <laughs> nice. Yes. Yeah, so we actually ended up with a wood chipper to process this cactus. We, and we, we smoke it over mesquite for, 24 to 48 hours, just like you would agave. And that basically softens up the, the cactus and gets a little bit of conversion, actually. There's some starches available to, to convert. And then we wood chipper it. And at the time, my kids called that stage of the process dog snot. <laughs> yeah, Black okay. And gooey and green and messy and, and uh, it'll bite you if you want. <laughs> and then from there, we, uh, we developed a, a recipe on how do we get the... Um, conversions we do a mash and, and we then uh, ferment on it so those are the flagships and they were all about can we genuinely and authentically take something truly of colorado and from colorado and get it into the bottle well yeah. so uh brad you're not a you're not a gin guy what do you think of this no, gin? so i actually like the gin i thought it was pretty good i was um so no so would this be a, a good gin and tonic gin or is this more of a sip and gin well, it's, it makes a phenomenal gin and tonic. You have to be a little bit careful. You can overwhelm it with the wrong tonic. So you're going to want to look for a tonic that is not overly sweet um, and not too much. Plug a brand for us. Fever Tree is not bad. That's uh, what I was going to suggest. Yep, I would say just use it. Use it carefully. Um, we do make our own tonic at the tasting room. Oh, oh really? That's cool. Very and cool. So we do have a recipe for tonics that we can share with folks who are interested. Nice. Really, nice. really cool. I love it. I actually, I think we, we kind of went through the entrepreneurial journey, right, Jeff? Right here with uh, Nels and uh, Dryland. <laughs> Absolutely, especially the part where he was suffering so horribly. Uh, <laughs> I love it that they put cactus into uh, tree chippers or tree tree grinders or whatever the hell those things are called. Yeah, well, I, 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 we haven't tasted the cactus, right? You haven't tried it yet, have you? I'm going right now. All right, all right. Let me let me drink the rest of you. This is going to be an interesting second half of the podcast. <laughs> Joel, yeah. Joel's a tequila guy, though. I, I'd like to hear from Joel on this one. That's true. Well, I'm not a gin guy, but I did enjoy the gin a lot. Uh, I'm starting to come around to that between the gin that I tried 
at Spirit Hound when we had them on a few months ago, and now uh -huh. Nell's Gin. I'm thinking, hmm, maybe we'll work some gin and tonics into the rotation once things start to heat up in the next couple uh -huh. of months. Did you try cactus, Joel? Oh, I did try the cactus, and uh, I like, I love, I mean, I love the, the, the flavor of it, but I also just love the story behind it. The Nels had a real commitment to this vision to make it truly Colorado and found a way to do it. So it's got that local element, the DIY elements, the artistic, crafty. the artistic, crafty, Absolutely. you know, artisan element to it. Those are check all my boxes. Yep. Yeah, not to mention creating their own yeast strain. I mean, there's all kinds of innovation going on here to do things with materials that, you know, there's a reason those aren't the materials that are usually used. And it's not because they don't work well as evidence is in front of us. There's all delicious beverages. It's because they're hard to do. <laughs> People right. probably are doing the most easy thing, but you've uh, you really imbibed the spirit of Colorado, uh, in my opinion, of like, hey, you know what? We're going to take what we got and, and make it absolutely awesome, which is kind of what I think Coloradans do to a large extent. Yep. Really, really good. Cool. So do you have, do you oh. have another, another drink in the pipeline? So we don't have another spirit in the pipeline per se. We are honestly we're trying to we're trying to open the second distillery at the point. Of <laughs> first. <laughs> um, there, there's a time when we're uh, like, okay, maybe we should focus. We actually have so much demand right now, particularly for the whiskeys and the cactus, that we are just trying to uh, ramp up and, and make sure we have enough to. We just we sell out. That's, That's a good problem. Yeah. yeah, that's good. Yeah, the the cactus. Um, Chefs, um, restaurants absolutely love it because it's oh, it's yeah. a phenomenally food friendly spirit. Believe it or not, it pairs with citrus and spice. But I think if there is another spirit that we're going to be exploring probably this fall, we're actually looking at a couple of them that are that are specific liqueurs, mainly to help us kind of really showcase more and more about the creativity of our bar team. Uh, we've got a, just a killer bar team. Uh, they've been with us since the very beginning. We do everything in the tasting room from you know we fresh juices, everything we use is made there on, on site from our bitters to our, our uh, tinctures. We even replicate a vermouth replica from our spirits, for example. So everything we do is, is made on, on site. So though we're probably gonna to go towards um, even packaging and releasing our vermouth because it's been so popular to have a non-wine-based vermouth that we've been getting a lot of pressure to, to release that one today. Really cool. Well, I, I would recommend anybody that's listening here, if you're into whiskey, gin, or prickly pear cactus, I don't, I don't know. It's not, it's not a tequila, is it? It's, it's a unique spirit. It's, yeah, a, it's just, it's kind of, it's on its own. It's um, not like that, tequila. It's, it's, it's yeah. much, uh, much more it's approachable. A, it definitely has those uh, smoky kind of flavors that a lot of the mezcal kind of tequilas have, but it, um, very, very easy drinking. I'm not a big tequila person myself, at least not since college. And, um, this is really nice. I like it a lot. Try it with citrus. Try it in a margarita, like a blood orange margarita. It's phenomenal. Yeah, I'm gonna set. My wife's a big margarita fan, so I'm gonna set that aside. Make sure I give it to her. Uh, yeah. It's delicious, though. So you got heirloom wheat whiskey, native Colorado gin, and prickly pear cactus spirits. Uh, look for them. Uh, so you said they're available in Colorado locally, Nels. They are. We have a select group of retailers and restaurants. The easiest way to keep up to date is uh, drylanddistillers.com. We have uh, where to find us link. You can always find us at places like Hazel's in, in Boulder. Sure. Boulder Wine Merchants. Uh, those are the, two of the key ones in, in Boulder. Wyatt's in Lamont and uh, several places in the immediate area as well, both North and South. And if awesome. you're listening to this from uh, far away, then that's good motivation to come visit us here in lovely Boulder, Colorado. And if you are an entrepreneur or a scholar of entrepreneurship, we would be happy to host you here on Creative Distillation and at the Dimming Center for Entrepreneurship. Have you come give a research talk, talk to some of our students. Nels, uh, could, we, could we persuade you to come by our classroom sometime and, and, and discuss this? I think it's just an awesome story. And your story is really a great illustration of entrepreneurial persistence. And, and uh, I, I got to be honest with you, our undergraduate students will probably perk up a little when you're talking about okay. distillery uh, versus an app. <laughs> yeah, they'd be pretty interested in this. Sure, I'd be happy to. We um, tie into the very beginning as well. I think I'm on my 136th conversation about investors right now. <laughs> <laughs>
he knows, he knows it's the 136th, not the 135th. Or right. So the yeah. point being is that you just, you can't give up. And uh, yeah, what I find amazing is that when it resonates, it resonates big time. Yeah, so, that's right. It's that connection, right? It's, it's that connection. And you just got to, you just got to hit it right. And you just cannot give up. Resilience is key here. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And you can never predict it either. I mean, that's the thing is like, I'm always, I've totally frustrated my students this semester. I gave them an exercise uh, at the end of the semester. I said, go talk to 20 people you think could be helpful in starting your venture. And they're like, we have to actually talk to them. I'm like, yes, you actually have to talk to them. Email doesn't count. Posting uh, on Snapchat does not count. You have to go speak to them because you don't know what's going to come out of those conversations. You never have any idea. And, um, and that's, that's not just something we're experienced. That's, that's the research shows this, the more entrepreneurs have lots of conversations with lots of potential stakeholders and more likely they are to find people that put skin in the game. Yep. And uh, hey know. Jeff, I, re I require my students to talk to a hundred people. A hundred? A hundred period. One hundred. One hundred. So yeah. you heard it here. If my, my students aren't listening, but if they did, uh, you <laughs> they got it easy Brad, in your class. It's Brad's fault. It's <laughs> all Brad's fault that next year it's a hundred people. Because you're right, though, you have to talk to people and you have to talk to people. And when they're 20, they kind of get a sense. But by the time they're at 100, they have a really good sense of which direction they need to go. Well, I didn't mention it's 20 in one week. Oh, no, no. I'm talking about I give them about six weeks. Yeah, no, this is like a one week challenge. They have, oh, okay. they have to talk to 20 people. So, but yeah, I like the idea of uh, but then actually I do have their final if they so my students, if they win their final pitch competition, they don't have to write the final report. Mm -hmm. They just automatically get an A on the final report and they're yep. done and they can go ski or whatever. But if they have to write the final report, they've got 50, but I'm up to a hundred based on what you said. I like yep. that. Yep. I, it's, I it's, truly it's, believe in that so much. And, so do hey, I. Nels, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you. I can't wait for your new location. And that's going to be right on the uh, main street in Longmont there. It is uh, five, five nineteen main street is where we'll be. And uh, we're, uh, three weeks, three months out from actually being able to have guests in officially, but right now it's open. Doors are always open. You can come in and check it out, see what we're doing. And our, our current location, by the way, our current distillery, which I encourage you to visit as well, is only a half a block uh, south of that. So come on in. Um, you get to walk into the back alley entrance through the, the distillery, and we can actually give you a tour of the space. Love it. Sounds awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, congratulations on on creating something really really unique and innovative and, and delicious. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank uh, you. I really, really have enjoyed it. And I guess if I had to take one word to, to sum up these, these, these beverages, I would say these are very smooth, smooth spirits. Every one of them was just clean, smooth, went down so easy, delicious. Very nice. Very yeah. nice. And the thing. whiskey's fantastic. You should see Brad's whiskey shelf. If it, if it, if he's going to buy it and put it on his shelf, that's pretty impressive, right? Really. Yeah, it's it's there. It's, it's you're there with some heavy hitters uh, up on that shelf. <laughs> Move over, <laughs> Pappy. There's a new player in town. <laughs> that's uh -oh. right. That's right. Yeah, we're, we're gunning for you. We're gunning for you. Uh, very All cool. Right. Well, well, thanks, gentlemen. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. And, it's uh, really our pleasure. It was great to talk to you. We'll look forward to seeing you soon in person. Yeah, we'll meet you in person. Sounds, Sounds great. great. All right. All right thanks, Nels. Yep. See you. Bye. Bye. So, uh, so cool, you know, at the Deming Center, we're always trying to make connection with local entrepreneurs. And it's always cool when on the podcast, we can actually do that. And I, I really do think he'd be great in the classroom. I think I'd be an awesome guest speaker. And maybe we can even talk him into mentoring the students, because I know they would love to hear from someone who actually makes makes whiskey. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, it's a, it's a cool story, too, right? The guy came out of industry, yeah. uh, did a little bit of consulting. <laughs> it seems to me that he did market research for another firm and used it for his own business. Yeah. <laughs> so, right? That's there clever. you go. Yeah, uh, so anyway, I, I liked him. And, and like I really am serious, though. The, I think the whiskey's great. Well, I do, too. I'm getting ready to pour the rest of it. And I see I see what you're drinking on the Zoom here, Brad. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're whiskey fans more than more than anything i mean i'm i'm more of a beer fan but if i'm gonna drink spirits i'm definitely gonna drink whiskey and this one is excellent i would buy some as well all right so for the first time in a while we're talking about paper without a guest brad this is uh this is kind of like old school creative distillation it uh, means i can be really honest what yeah <laughs> Yeah, as opposed to your normal take with the authors here, where you're so polite and say like, yeah. "What the f are you thinking here? Like, how the hell did you come up with this title?" Or like things Who like hired that. you to these people that spent like you know 15 years writing these papers. Um, 
you know, it's a shame because uh, I was thinking, it's not really a shame, but I was thinking we should get these authors on and maybe we will. So the paper I want to talk about today, it's uh, in press and organization science. Uh, organization science is a really interesting journal, tends to publish more things that come from a sociological perspective, as well as um, a big part of what organization science looks for is papers that uh, are somewhat counterintuitive, a little more beyond the pale, a little further afield than some of the other journals. I'm a member of the editorial board, full disclosure. I think it's a fantastic journal. I've only had one paper ever accepted there. So it's not like they give me any favoritism because they've rejected a lot more of them. It's a very, very, in our field, high status, uh, well-received journal. And uh, I was just looking around for papers to talk about. And I found this. This is up on press. It's by Todd Schiffling. Uh, Do you know these folks, Jeff? Well, these, uh, uh, these, who are these folks? But Todd Schiffling is assistant professor in strategic management at the Fox School of Business at Temple. He does PhD in sociology at the University of Michigan. He was also a postdoctoral fellow at the Herb Institute. Uh, the Herb Institute is a really uh, great organization at University of Michigan. And what they do is they do research into sustainability and business. And uh, they've got some world leading scholars there. They really do a nice job of integrating consideration of a particularly environmental sustainability into world-class research. A lot of great scholars have been Herb Institute postdoctoral fellows. And then his uh, co-author is Daphne Dimitri, who's an assistant professor of strategy and organization. And I always mispronounce this, uh, at the DeSaltis faculty of DeSaltis faculty. <laughs> See, I knew I couldn't do it. She's at McGill University. I can never pronounce the name of their business school. I knew I was going to screw up, especially after all this whiskey. Uh, <laughs> she did her <laughs> postdoctoral fellow at Said at, at Oxford and did her PhD also in sociology at Northwestern University. I and I think these folks' background kind of comes through uh, nicely in this study because, and the study is called, I love the, okay, wait a minute. So, so wait, Brad, come on, let's see what you think here. Come on. <laughs> I've read it, so I, I know it's coming. <laughs> it's not that bad. All right. The new food truck in town. That That's okay, right? They okay. should just stop there. <laughs> okay, yeah, but this isn't so bad. Geographic communities and authenticity based entrepreneurship. Okay, so first of all, when I, when I read the first sentence of the abstract, authenticity is a value attribution for organizations. No. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Okay, so, I mean, the bottom line is... The rest of the sentence, like you just read the first half of it. I did, because that's, that's all I'm going to read of this paper. Oh, oh come on now. I mean, <laughs> no, 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 I'm, 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 no, no, I'm going to have you explain it to me, and then I'll tell you whether and I think it's... The whole point of the podcast is that you're not supposed to read the paper. I know, but that's what I'm saying. So I read the first sentence. Yeah, so okay, I'm, I'm good, saying true to our see, charter. You're, you're totally breaking our charter. Like, uh, <laughs> and if we go back to old school creative distillation where we were hanging out uh, in person, yeah. you never read any of the papers, like not even the title. I, I always read the abstracts. Oh, did you? Okay. Well, yeah. Okay. Well, so go ahead. I mean, so okay. the rest of the sentence, but one that raises a challenge of audience acceptance for innovative entrepreneurs. Let me stop you there. Let now, do you, not, there. do you not think that's true? I mean, just, I mean, just that one sentence. Oh, so so I think it's totally true, but I think it's I think it's totally apparent. My that's question, the, okay, okay, that's that's great, that's great. What you are trying to do in the first sentence of a paper is to write something that is clearly true. Okay, this is an academic strategy, and so if, if we have any young PhD students or maybe that hasn't written a ton of papers or people that are trying to get tenure or whatever, they're writing a lot of papers. The first sentence of a paper should be unequivocally true. Okay. Because what you're this is just like a pitch, right? Yeah. Like I'm gonna do a pitch. Cancer is a growing problem in the United States. <laughs> okay. okay, right. No, 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 wait, no, no, it's not. It's not a problem, right? Like yeah. I mean, you ever see a pitch start with like something like toenail fungus is the biggest medical issue we face in this country? <laughs> you're like, okay, I'm done. Thank you very much. Or sometimes my whiteboard marker runs out of ink and I don't know what to do. Like, you know, these are obviously not big problems for people. It's just like an entrepreneurial pitch. You're trying right. to make sure that the first sentence is true. And I right. think, uh, you know, that's great that you think that. Okay. Okay. Wait, wait. So, I want to stop you there, though, because I have a question sure, for go you. Go ahead, please. So yeah. my question is, do you think that large organizations, by definition, can be authentic? I do. I do think they can. I'm still on the fence. I'm not sure. I actually see this, this kind of, the way that a, a company progresses is founded by a small group of people, starts to get traction. Yeah. They're running everything through their values framework. There's authenticity right. there, but I think that authenticity gets lost somewhere in that growth phase. Well, so here's the thing. This is, this is actually getting to the insight 
this is kind of pretty well known to most uh, entrepreneurship scholars that study authenticity. And I'll just harken back. If you're just joining us, uh, gosh, Joel, help me out. How many podcast episodes would they go back to get to our Isabel podcast? I believe that's episode 14. And this is 17. Okay, so there we go. Thank you. Joel's not sampling. So he can he can okay. remember these things. And he's just smarter than me too. So the um, we were talking with Isabel about individuals perception of their own authenticity, and right. how that's a challenge for entrepreneurs. But when we talk about authenticity, for a company, I mean, that's in the eyes of the perceivers, right? It's in the of eyes of the audience. Like, so whether or not you can say a large company is authentic or not really depends on authentic to whom. And, and I, think, I think it is easier for companies to project an image of authenticity when they're very tightly aligned to their customer's value proposition or their customer's values, I should say, beyond what their product offers. So an example I would give is uh, Patagonia. Patagonia, of course, makes good clothing. But I think despite the fact that they, by some people's assessments, don't do as much around environmental sustainability as say the North Face, are still perceived as much more authentic because they wear that values of environmental stewardship on their sleeve. And they put out things like the Wall Street Journal yeah. ad don't buy this jacket, right? Right. Um, so, so I think that that's the easy one to pick. I think that okay, that's the one that people easy. people lean on the most. So, give me a, give me an example outside of the clothing industry. Outside of the clothing industry, that's a good question. Tesla. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I actually don't know. I mean, I I think it's certainly. I would say that Tesla is authentic to Elon Musk and what he's trying to do. So, yeah, I, I would give you Tesla. Ben and Jerry's, even though they're owned by Unilever. And, right, and but, it, but but the point is, I think it's a small group. I do. I, I think it's, I, to your point, I don't disagree with you. I think it's hard. Right. Um, I think it's difficult to maintain that perception of authenticity as you grow. And here's the thing. Here, here's, the, here's the tension in this paper. I want to see if you think this is, this is real. What they're saying in this paper is that there's two types of authenticity. One is an authentic, what they call type authenticity, which just think about that as conformity. Okay. Uh, being an easily understood business that someone can look at and just say, yeah, I get that. Okay, you're, uh, well, in the, in the case of the paper, you're a steakhouse. It's a steakhouse. They have steak, they have butter on top of the steak. They've got really expensive cocktails. They probably have an iceberg salad with a bunch of blue cheese on it. You know, it's a steakhouse. That's easy to understand. If I go to a steakhouse, I want to go to a steakhouse. And then there is what they are calling craft authenticity. And I think this absolutely relates back to what we were just talking about with oh, Nels. Yeah. And craft authenticity is defined in the paper. And I'm going to read from the paper. Skilled hands-on techniques, sophisticated ingredients, small-scale artistry, rather than mass industrial manufacturing. These producers gain license to be highly innovative and transcend type boundaries. Yeah. So wait, so I, I agree 100%. First of all, I agree that uh, Nels is that person that you just described. But does that change? Nels said that they're selling out of everything, right? That yeah. they have to expand. Right. Is there a point where you reach, you know, Coors 40 years ago? Was Coors that? And then they scaled? Look, the whole thing was about going over the Rocky Mountains to get the Coors, right? Right. Like, I mean, we would have people visiting from Colorado and Chicago, and they'd have a trunk load of Coors because you couldn't buy it in, in Chicago. Wait, I got another one then for you. You're a Chicago, Vienna beef. Ooh, Vienna beef. I like, I like them very much. It's very authentic. It's true Chicago, man. I mean, there's no substitute for a Vienna yep. beef hot dog. Yeah. Or, and, and they've scaled. And they have scaled there. I mean, yep. we, you and I go get a Chicago style hot dog right downtown, Vienna beef. Yeah, um, really, that's a good point. I, and, and music is another kind of category. I think musicians and bands are entrepreneurs. Um, oh, I totally agree. About, I, like authenticity to a musical form. But see, so their point is like, there's sort of two forms of authenticity you can have as an entrepreneur. You can be an easily understood business that fits an archetype and people are like, oh yeah, that's, that's the thing I need. Therefore, I will go there. Think Outback Steakhouse, right? It's like, you know, it's another steakhouse. It's got a little bit of a spin on it. I'm just using steakhouses because that's what they have in the paper. We're Make getting me hungry. To, yeah, well, we'll get to how they, you're hungry when you hear about Outback Steakhouse. No, no, no. But, but the first you steakhouse I was. Than that? Come on. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, our sponsors for this week, uh, I just wanted to mention JD's Joy Rides, our producer, Joel Davis's bicycle tour of the murals of Boulder, Colorado. And you might say to yourself, hey, 
uh, what do I care about the murals of Boulder, Colorado? Well, you haven't seen the murals. They're amazing. And it's a really cool way to go see the entire town. If you haven't checked this out, JD's Joy Rides, J as in Joel, D as in Davis, S, joyrides.com is our official sponsor. And I'm sorry, I forgot to name drop you at the beginning of the podcast. <laughs> and by the way, even going and seeing the mur murals with Joel would be a blast. But just hanging out with Joel, I think, for the afternoon. Well, actually, yeah, this you don't really have to see the murals. You get, but riding around on electric bikes and seeing the murals. Oh, yeah. It's, maybe it's, going cool. and getting a beer or two. Uh, I mean, you can't beat that. Yep. All right. That was our quick uh, our quick sponsor message. I'm getting better at it. Maybe one day we'll have like another sponsor besides JD's Joy Rides. But anyway, okay, so back to the paper. So what they're doing, uh, they're saying is there's these two forms of authenticity. And if you're going to go after this craft authenticity, it's going to matter where you locate geographically. And that's what I really like about this paper for the podcast is it's got a real message in it because we see, I mean, gosh, Brad, how many craft uh, craft entrepreneurs would you say you got going in your class right a now? A lot, a lot. Yeah, it's a growing movement. It's a growing area of study in academia too. And there's a reason for that, I think. I think we're seeing a cultural shift where uh, millennials as well as Gen Zers are looking for things that are authentic because they've grown up in a largely artificial world where they're just dialed in. I mean, and God knows the pandemic has made that even worse for people. Certainly, has. I, 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 Let me go a step farther. Please. If you aren't authentic in your business and as you grow your business, you're not going to survive. I think authenticity is necessary. And so I, I wrote down these two terms because the first one you mentioned was conformity. Yep. I don't think conformity is authentic. Authentic. I think yeah. conformity means that you're fitting into something that maybe you're uncomfortable with. And yeah. craft authenticity, I'd never heard that term until today, I think is, is awesome. Yeah. And so they're, they are kind of creating that term. So first of all, that's the first thing that I think is interesting. Like just the concept of craft authenticity. Yep. As I think about myself as an entrepreneur, well, okay, the idea is that there's a trade-off, right? The further, and you know this is true, Brad, I think you will. I mean, maybe you won't, but I, I'm pretty sure knowing you, you will. The more innovative you get as an entrepreneur, the more you challenge the status quo. For example, uh, Nell's creating whiskey out of wheat instead of uh, corn or, or barley or something else. The further afield you get from that, the more traditional audiences, the people that are looking for whiskeys, are going to be more skeptical about your product claims, right? Yes. If I'm like a, you know, uh, I only care about like Scotch whiskeys from the Northern Highlands, or I only drink <laughs> bourbon from Kentucky, blah, 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 whatever. I'm not even going to think about trying this wheat whiskey. I'm like, oh, it's bullshit. Yeah, but they're not your customers. They're not even your target customers, right? Right. And that's just the point of the paper. You're right. You need it. the innovators and the early adapters. You're nailing it. So if you're going to go start your wheat whiskey distillery, you want to be, and this is, I'm just going to cut to the chase because we, we've already talked to Nels for a while. And I just want to distill this down real quick and see what you think about this. And the point of the paper, distilled down simply for you entrepreneurs out there, is if you are relying on craft authenticity, and as I define that, that's notions of hands-on techniques, sophisticated yep. ingredients. I didn't define it that way. Uh, Todd and, and Daphne did in their paper. You know, you know what craft is when you see it. You are going to want to be in a community, like for your startup time, you want to go in a community that number one, has a high level of education. Now, is it because there's going to be smarter people there? No, it's because there's this classification that sociologists use for people that seek out extreme ends of experiences. They seek out, you know, they'll go to like a local um, food court when they're traveling abroad and, and eat like, you know, the street food, there's not, nothing fancy about it. At the same time, they'll pay exorbitant amounts for a unique experience. And those type of people tend to be highly educated. And they call them cultural omnivores, people who will sample a wide array of experiences and don't differentiate and evaluate them all the same. It's like, hey, that's a great experience. We kind of fit the cultural omnivore. I'm not trying to say we're cool or anything. Certainly, when it lists the podcast knows that's not the case. But uh, cultural omnivores are people that seek a wide array of experience. And those tend to be highly educated people. So you want to be in a place with high education. The way they measure that in the paper is the density of universities and the numbers of bachelor's degree in a city. So we live there is what you're talking. Boulder is one of those places. There is a cultural omnivore. And gee, what do you know? Uh, how many craft uh, oh companies God. have we talked about now? I think that's all we talk about, right? Well, and you can walk down a street and you see mom and pop custom shoes now. And I mean, every, you have leather makers and even shaves and haircuts, which I wouldn't know much about. But, you know, all these types of things, they're, they're popping up all over the place. But here, I, my question before you finish, because you're talking about that, when you're talking about this craft 
which I think is, I really embrace that. I mean, that, that resonates with me yeah. as a person, okay. but can they scale? Can, sure, sure, it, sure. Or is there is there this tipping point where they can only scale so far and it yeah. turns into more of that conformity? It's a great question, and it's not the question this paper addresses. So I can't say from the research that Todd Depp. What's your what's, what's your gut tell you? I think they can. I think it's tricky. I think it's a tightrope. And an example I would think about locally is New Belgium Brewing Company, which is scaled and since been acquired. And the view of like craft beer enthusiasts would say has lost its authenticity. Others would say, hey, you know what? They're still brewing the same beers. They're still experimenting. They're still doing other things. So who can say? Again, it's in the eyes of the audience. You know yeah. what we should do? I know some professors at CSU that stayed exactly this. They wrote a paper called Selling Out or Selling In. Mm -hmm. And we should just get them on here to talk about this. So I'll, so let's table that question because I can't answer it. And it uh, but it's a question on... that's been resonating with me for a long time, not just today. So I, I'd love to hear have them. Yeah, well, let's get them in here uh, and we'll see what they say. Personally, my answer is I think it can be done. I don't think it can be done in the same way that, um, well, okay, here's the thing. Because I'm defining this as subjectively in the eyes of the audience, what do you think of when you think of Burt's Bees? I don't know much about Burt's Bees. I've tried their chapstick a couple times. Do you like it? Uh, I've used it once. So okay. it did nothing for me, right? I, okay, I, it did I'm, I'm neutral. I'm agnostic on Burt's Bees. You didn't think of Clorox? No. Clorox <laughs> owns Burt's Bees. So... You know, they don't appear to be inauthentic. But now that you know that, maybe you wouldn't. So know. It, it and all... Justin's Peanut Butter, right? They were re acquired by Hormel. Hormel, right? Yeah, so I, I don't know. I, you know, so anyway, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I think I think it can be done. I think, I don't think most people that buy Justin's. You know what, though? When we have those guys on, I'd like to have one of my friends on that's an expert marketer as well, Eric Bruno. I'd, I'd yeah, love to have Eric. Bruno on and challenge them on, is that, is it a persona that they're creating or is it this craftiness, this artisanship that it's grown out of? And I'd, I'd really love to be able to distinguish the two because I, I have a feeling that when they get big, it is Clorox can own Burt's Bees, but we're going to market it the way that they did when they were first. There, there's fresh. no doubt. There's no doubt that that's absolutely done. So I, I, I we don't need Bruno to tell us that. Yeah, that's, okay. That's true. And, and, and Tom and, and Yolanda will tell us the same thing, but, but I love that idea. Let's do that. Okay. So, okay. Let me go through this paper real quick. So yep. uh, uh, high educated community. Here's a more interesting one. You want high cultural diversity, which we do not have here in Boulder. Yeah. And the reason... They say that is because when you have higher cultural diversity, people are more accepting of other viewpoints and they're more accepting of nonconformity, whatever that means to them. Yep. And, and then the last one is you want to have, you know, there's this long research on, on clusters and Silicon Valley and, you know, you know, all this stuff about clustering and, and agglomeration and knowledge spillovers and industry and all that stuff. What they're saying is actually what you want from this perspective, there's nothing technological about, and by the way, what they're studying here is food truck density. Right. It's a really interesting thing. And the way they collected this day is fascinating. Uh, we, we'll get them on some time to talk about because they actually gathered it using Twitter. It's fascinating, the methods in this paper. It's really cool. Uh, you want other similar adjacent craft industries. And the way they measure that in this paper is the density of craft breweries and food truck locations. Now we know that craft breweries, because we live in one of these places, craft breweries also often host food trucks because oh, yeah. they don't have a food license. So there's a, a, an underlying mechanism there. It makes me a little doubtful of that one. I'm like, okay, that's cool. But the way you measured it, there's probably some underlying causality it has nothing to do with culture. Here's what you don't want though. And I love this. You do not want high conformity in the industries you're surrounded by. And conformity they measure is number one, the density of steakhouses. <laughs> this is great. Like, like how many steakhouses are in the city? Okay, that's a high conformity city. There's a lot of steakhouses. They're all pretty much the same thing. Right. They're steakhouses. And if you don't buy that one, because I know you're from Chicago and there's a lot of great steakhouses in Chicago and they're not the same. Right. The second one is chain restaurants. Density of chain restaurants representing high conformity and, and community. And they actually find a negative relationship between food truck entry and the number of chain restaurants. Now you and I might say, hey, well, that's actually an opportunity. There's always chain restaurants. People are sick of them. They want something to No, they actually find out that's not good for you because people are not used to it. And they're not willing to say, by God, I'm, I'm going to go to eat at the food truck instead of TGI Fridays. No, nope, uh, screw that. I'm going to TGI Fridays. So this is actually, I really believe this is helpful for our craft entrepreneurs. Like you want to go to university towns 
preferably with high cultural diversity, and you want to go to places that have a similar, not necessarily a lot of competition, but similar kind of craft aesthetic going on, and you want to avoid places with high density of chain restaurants. I thought that was pretty cool for Sounds like places that I'd like to live anyway. I, I mean, chain restaurants, right. Uh, right? I mean, who... who, who who chooses to live there? Uh, a lot. Well, there's a reason they exist, Brad. They oh, yeah. No, I, I know. I'll say taking my takeaway from the paper, uh, which is something that I believed for a long time, authenticity by definition is critical. Yes. Maintaining that authenticity as you grow is very, very difficult. And I'd love to talk to your folks so that we can even go more in depth and to find out if there's a tipping point, what that means and all of those other things. Yeah. Well, let's get Todd and Daphne on too, because I think this is a really interesting paper. And unfortunately, we don't have enough time to talk about the methods behind this, but it's truly fascinating what they did. It's very, very creative. And they actually identify that very question, Brad, as something for future research. So I think that's something they would love talking about. So cool. But cool. Fun. Um, it's Todd Schilling and Daphne Dimitri, new, the new food truck in town. I, I keep thinking of, uh, what's that song? There's a new kid in town. <laughs> anyway, the paper is called The New Food Truck in Town, Geographic Communities and Authenticity Based Entrepreneurship. Go check it out. Uh, it's in Organization Science Online. It's open access, so you won't have to pay 50 bucks like Brad Whoa, does. Oh, that's amazing. I know, I know. I'm, I'm liking these folks already. Yeah, see, I'm making all mine open. I, see, the, these wonderful journals offer you the opportunity to pay them only like, you know, $100 to make it open access. So that's very generous of them to do that, I think, for their free resources they gain. So anyway, uh, I hope you enjoyed talking about Brad. I think there are some lessons in that. I think it's kind of cool. I mean, figure out where to go do your craft business. Here, here's my balance between the paper and going for a bike ride with JD's, uh, what is it called again, Joel? JD's? JD's Joy Rides at jdsjoyrides.com. Yeah, JD's, JD's Joy Rides or Dryland Distillers. I'm going to take the paper with me, but I'm going to go for a joy ride on the way to the distillery. There you go. Well, I don't know what I can add to that. <laughs> uh, All right. It was well, good. thank you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we appreciate you stopping by the uh, Creative Distillation Podcast brought to you by the Deming Center for Entrepreneurship at the University of Colorado. Uh, my name is Jeff York. Once again, my guest is Brad Werner. And uh, we were joined today by Dryland Distillers. You can check them out at drylanddistillers.com. Wonderful beverages. Uh, also check out jdsjoyrides.com, our other sponsor. Take an electric bike tour of Boulder, Colorado. And uh, if you have any feedback for us, please uh, send us an email. We're at cdpodcast at colorado.edu. That's not CD like uh, seeds you would plant your tomato plant with or whatever plant you're trying to plant. Uh, it's not a CD podcast. It's C as in creative, D as in distillation, podcast at colorado.edu. Uh, and by the way, Jeff, th those emails oh. come directly to my inbox. So I'd yes. love to hear from some folks. All right. If you, if you enjoyed what you heard today, uh, hit the subscribe button, uh, post your review, tell others. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. My pleasure, Brad. Great talking to you. Yeah, you too.